Hello everyone and welcome to the launch of the Global Rapid Response Campaign. My name is Lauren Poach and I'm the event manager here at Stewardship and I'm going to be your host for this series of webinars over the next five weeks. Now I would very much love it if you could all join me as we pray for this series of webinars. <sighs> Father God we just thank you for um, how big and mighty you are, how you are so much bigger than the circumstances that we face, that you have um, a hand over everything, Lord. Um, so Father, we just uh, thank you for the inspiration that you've brought us all to bring this campaign to light. And thank you for every single person who has joined us today. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we, um, yeah, just really open our eyes to um, what is really happening in the world uh, to do with the coronavirus and we just pray that you can just open our eyes to see the world as you see it and um, really hear the calling that you have each of us to step out into. So yeah, we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. From COVID-19, there are millions and millions affected. A second wave from scientists is what is expected and though some of us here are protected, there are thousands across the world that are neglected, communities disconnected, parents rejected, and children unprotected, all because they don't have masks or sanitizers to be disinfected. So for this to change, we need to get connected. God's people, us, the church, have to come together and say, challenge accepted, because this pandemic compounds the daily issues that people in deprived areas face. And just in case you struggle to picture yourself in the same space, imagine struggling for work in order to pay for food or clean water. Never mind providing education fees for your son or your daughter, but just doing everything you can for them to survive, while accepting that you don't have the funds for them to thrive. We believe a global issue demands a biblical response, like love your neighbor, as it's because of love Jesus became our savior. Help those who are in need, then those who are chained by illnesses and poverty can be freed. Be a faithful giver, as there is a delight in trusting God and watching Him deliver. Because it's time for us to no longer observe, but to stand up and serve. It's time for all of us to give so that others can continue to live. It's time to do more than just shine a light on different COVID cases. It's time to save faces and transform places by giving on a day-to-day -day basis. Because to save a heart, you've got to show your heart. And to show your heart, you've got to play your part. So now's the time to start. As one people, as one body, we can unite our forces to make sure every country has the resources to beat this virus. So come on, we're calling on you. Because we know with your help, there's nothing our God can't do. At the end of March, Stewardship raised and distributed nearly 5 million in just 100 days to make 100 grants to churches and Christian charities serving people most affected by the coronavirus across the UK. Now, we were inspired by our donors and their willingness to serve and felt a call to take this response global. United together with global organisations, Stewardship have partnered with Trustbridge Global Foundation, the McClellan Foundation, A21 Campaign, Open Doors, Tier Fund and World Vision. Together, we are set to deliver five webinars showing the impact that the coronavirus is having across the world in regions such as Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, in hopes to inspire the church into action with biblical principles of what it means to be a generous giver. So let's talk about the agenda for today. We should have a slide coming up, perfect. So, First, we'll be hearing from the leaders of Stewardship, Trustbridge Global and the McClellan Foundation, who will give insight on what it means to be a global donor. We hear, um, we'll then hear from our partnering organisations who will help us understand the challenges that are being faced um, at the moment with the pandemic. After that, we'll hear from our founder, from the founder of A21, Christine Kane, who has kindly pre-recorded a message specifically for this webinar today. 
We will then be having a short Q&A towards the end of today's webinar with the panel representatives from Stewardship, Trustbridge and the McClellan Foundation. Now, it'd be really great for you guys to all send in questions to us, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions throughout the webinar. We'll get to as many of them as we can um, in the time that we have scheduled. And then lastly, we'll hand over to Mark Sheard, CEO of World Vision, for his concluding remarks and to close in prayer. So we've got a lot to get through. We're very aware that you've all got busy things to be doing. So um, we'd love for you to, um, I'd love to hand over to Stuart McCulloch, who is the CEO of Stewardship, Tricia Collins, Vice President of Trustbridge Global, and Daryl, Daryl Heald, who is the Director of Generosity at the McClellan Foundation. Good day to all of those who've joined and uh, um, Good morning to Daryl and Tricia who are joining us from the US. Um, I hope you're not yeah. being affected by Hurricane Laura um, this morning. Um, we're going to go through three questions really quickly. Um, and the first really is, uh, what's the role of the church and Christian charities in the recovery from this crisis? Um, and I think um, I'll, I'll make three points and I'll hand over to you, Tricia. I think that the that we need to be people of hope at a time of fear and anxiety. Mm. Um, and I think that's the primary thing. And the, the people around us need um, um, practical help, but most of all, gospel hope in these difficult times. And with governments super stretched and uh, secular charities struggling, it is really a time for the church to step forward as a group. What do you think, uh, you, what are you seeing from, from, from this, Trish? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I think we have a sort of a blending of responsibility and opportunity as the church in any kind of crisis, hmm. uh, especially now because it's such a big global, you know, kind of media rich, um, it, it's impacting everyone. It's not specific regional, kind of like a tsunami or a hurricane like we're experiencing. Um, and I keep thinking about those concepts of salt and light and how the church has this kind of a mandate. We have this responsibility to do certain things in a crisis, you know, to provide practical relief, to be that food, the cup of water, the clothing, the, the shelter. But also as kind of the, the influencer, the enhancer of the world, you know, in terms of being the salt and how we have this opportunity to model not just empathy and service, stewardship, you know, peace, healing of all types of wounds, physical uh, responses, and, but, you know, kind of ideas of generosity and scarcity when economies are changing, you know, we still have just amazing opportunities to model as the body of Christ, that kind of Christ-like way of viewing the world and responding to the world. So, yeah, I, I think it's a blending of responsibility, but also just huge opportunity to provide hope in the in the face of you know practical needs as well thank you trace daryl yeah thanks thanks Stuart. appreciate the opportunity to participate and i, I would say look as, as generous givers this is um this is what we look for we look for opportunities yeah. like this and um so we shouldn't be scared of uh scared about it but we should like move into it and so uh, you know the world because the world needs us now more than ever uh, it's exactly what you said. A lot of things are broken. There's a lot of fear and anxiety, but, but generous, think about this. How do we actually show that, um, show our hope? I, I love that video that y'all just showed, you know, um, to, to show our heart, we have to do our part. Right. And I believe that generosity is, is the, um, uh, is one of the greatest apologetics today and the ability say like of the organizations that will be presenting today, all work with the local church. And I think the real key for us as givers is to decentralize this as, as, uh, as quickly and as, as possible. And so what these organizations, the uh, Tier Fund, World Vision, A21, Open Doors do is working with, with the churches because they live there. They live in these communities. They live in the slums. They know the people. They have those relationships. And so uh, for, for us as givers, you know, we need to, we, we need to empower them to decentralize this as quick as possible where people are really struggling. Thanks, Daryl. You've led us on to the second question, which is really how should generous Christians be responding at this at this time? And, and what are they searching for at home and abroad? And I, 
I, I think we've seen three things in stewardship. I mean, the first is how amazingly generous people are being. Uh, and we've seen giving actually increase, which has been mm -hmm. astounding, which is a, in relative terms, a huge increase in generosity. Um, we find that givers are hungry for information of how, mm -hmm. about how and where they can make a difference. And I think that's partly why we're holding these, these, these webinars to give that information, more information to come. Um, and um, they're also looking to beyond the crisis to a new season of, mm -hmm. of opportunity for the church to step forward. Uh, what do you think donors are looking for, um, Tricia? Yeah, I, I, I would say the same thing. I'm seeing kind of this increase. Um, people are spurred to help. People mm. just generally want to help. They see a crisis happening. Um, I see a lot of confusion sometimes um, because people want to know that, that the way that they're investing, whether it's time or treasure, you know, money, whatever it is, they want to know that it's having the impact that they think it's having. They want to work with trusted people. Um, and they want us to be able to sort through some of that noise like you're talking about, you know, you, there's just such strange information, missing gaps of information, things like that. And, but to Daryl's point, I think they also want this sense of almost like a sense of collaboration and community in the way that mm -hmm. it's happening. So, you know, I may not mm -hmm. know some community in Southeast Asia, but I know people that know that. So I, I want to I always want to encourage the people that we talk to to tap into kind of that that curiosity, that natural curiosity of who is doing what and where and how do I partner with them? How do I support them? I'm not called on the ground, but I have a different type of resource to mobilize. And so how does how do how does all that work together? And I think donors are very interested in that being a part of something greater than just their one part of the puzzle. Brilliant. Carol? Yeah, I, and I, I think, well, I think, you know, doing exactly what y'all are, are doing here, convening and, and creating the, the platform and then hopefully, uh, you know, from this where you get great information and, uh, and, and, and build up a little bit more knowledge and, uh, and expertise um, from people who are actually doing it is that I, I think there needs to be more community, uh, intentional community amongst givers. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think the, I think a lot of the, a lot of the ministries have been doing, you know, working really well, working with the church, all these different things. But I think sometimes maybe the most disconnected and least collaborative piece sometimes can be givers because we, you know, it's, it, we, we tend to isolate. And then during these times, right, it's really hard with all the isolation to do that. So I think if we can find ways to communicate more with each other, and I would say also just as a, uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that we've been looking at at, at McClellan is really, you know, is, is being less concerned about the actual project and, and more concerned about the organiz organizational capacity, their mm -hmm. ability to do what they really want to do. And, uh, and, and during these times, you know, the, you know, I think we all kind of love, I just want to do a project, but I, I think we really need to look at uh, the, the leadership team, the organizational capacity they need. And, and here's the key question. Here's the key question we can all ask. Uh, how can I help? And again, Daryl, you lead on to the third and final question, which is, is, is really we see need increasing everywhere, um, but we see charities struggling um, for capacity for funding and for other things. And we see people trying to balance between home uh, and, and overseas and, and a great deal of need close to home. Um, mm -hmm. And we're asking, how do we balance that? And certainly my comment on that question would be, our media is certainly here in the UK, and I would guess in, in the US is very domestically focused at the moment. So we lack information about uh, 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 what's happening in other places. And then the other thing is, is where do you go to find reliable information about what's happening with the church in other places? And the Christian community, you know, isn't well served necessarily by press and press comment. And so how do we gather that information flow and how do we understand and, and prioritize relative to home and abroad the needs of, of, of people who are responding to this crisis? And how do you see that happening? Tricia, to you again. Yeah, I, th I think kind of what Daryl was talking about is this intentionality mm -hmm. around giving yeah. communities. I mean, you, a lot of times you really do have to seek it out because in the US, it's very similar to what's happening in the UK. There's a lot of kind of domestic focus, what state is doing what and who's got terrible numbers. And 
Um, you know, there's mention of other countries, but nothing very practical in terms of these are the way that people, these are the ways that people are really struggling, or these are the, the problems that we're seeing. Um, so yeah, I think there's some intentionality, you know, tap, tapping into your own kind of curiosity, your own networks, your own, you know, having deliberate discussions with yeah. people, speaking out things like this, where you say, okay, I have some curiosity. I know that there are people who are trying to gather this sort of information. Let me access that. And let me tell other people to access that so that we can make kind of better informed, you know, decisions about the way we want to proceed personally as a group, as a church. Um, yeah, I mean, you just have to go out and find the information that you really need. Um, and sometimes that takes some digging. I mean, thanks, Tricia. And, and um, um, last but not least, Daryl, uh, what's your, your comment yes. and perhaps say a final comment on this whole thing? Sure. Well, I, I, uh, I, I think what, what y'all are doing here is, is what a lot of people, a lot of us as givers want is, is if you can, you, you can, you know, play, a, uh, play this host and uh, convening and, and, and aggregating role uh, with, with opportunities as well as you have a relationship with, you know, thousands of givers, right, who are stewardship clients and, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, you know, the, the, the big idea would be to, you know, for people to be able to um, meet each other somewhere, even if it's just on a digital platform for, you know, within geographic areas that have an interest in, we're saying in the Middle East or Southeast Asia or where, where things, this thing is, is moving and there's a dynamism to it. So we need to be able to uh, adjust. And look, I think the, like, these are extraordinary times. And so kind of how our you know, in extraordinary times requires an extraordinary response. Yes. So kind of how we've been, kind of what our, you know, our method of operating, what we were comfortable with before, I think we need to be willing to be, you know, allow that to just kind of, you know, go away and say, God, you know, open me up, help me to, uh, you know, in faith with, you know, with, with courage, press into this, right? And, and as you already said, hey, we, you, you've seen giving going up as well. And I, and I think there, there has been, you know, equally with, with a lot of the ministries taking a lot of risk and stepping out in faith and just helping uh, uh, do some things. Like I heard yesterday on a, on a, where we're like Compassion International, uh, that they went ahead and, and uh, it was a $40 million um, decision that they were not going to turn away uh, anyone, even though their, their mechanisms for raising that type of money all went away. But they they said we're we're not going to say no, and it was a forty million dollar um, in faith wow. decision this year of what they're going to do. And I think in but the 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 great thing is that the uh, Jimmy Miato, the CEO there, said, but, but their their givers are responding. They're like, yeah. okay, if you're if you're willing to do that, we're willing to go with you. And and I think that's what we want, right? This this whole spurring on. If we if we are living by faith and not by sight. Uh, then uh, I think that's where uh, what, what that, that's how we're designed to be, and that's where we want to live. And so, um, you know, may God give us that faith. Well said, Daryl, and, and and thank you, Tricia. I mean, uh, you're going to hear from us a little bit later during the Q and A session, so it's it's not the last time you'll hear from us. But I'll I'll hand back to Lauren now, and she can carry on, and we'll hear hear people stepping out in that faith. Thank you very much, guys. Speak to you later. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Wow. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary responses. It really is um, so inspiring to hear just how people are so willing to, you know, give not only financially, but just their hearts and prayers um, at a time like this. Um, but that leads us nicely into the next section where we're about to hear from our partnering organisations who have been working on the ground on the front line, helping those in need across the globe. So first, we're going to hear from Christian Elliott the Director of Global Development at A21. Listen, thank you so much for having us today. Um, I'll jump straight into it. So A21 has 
oh my goodness, it's 18 offices now in 13 countries. And um, the, the pillars or the, the, the core programmatic elements uh, that we've had a, uh, that we've been really blessed in actually is number one, 24-7 uh, human trafficking hotlines around the world. Uh, hotline is extremely important to give the public the opportunity to give us tips so that we can follow those tips and intervene on behalf of uh, victims around the world and also to gather the information that will lead to intelligence uh, to prosecute a perpetrator of trafficking. Number two pillar is our global campaigns such as Can You See Me? That was a video we were going to see about um, uh, online child exploitation and how that has grown. You know, the import, it's important to give people awareness, but it's also important to give people the ability um, to act upon that and uh, to spot the indicators of human trafficking and be part of the, part of the fight, so to speak. Number three, um, we have what's called child advocacy centers. Now, we work and intervene on behalf of a lot of children around the world. So number one, it is our, it is our duty to care and protect for those children. Um, but number two, also, it is to um, accurately uh, collate their witness statement. Because if we were to intervene on behalf of a child with local law enforcement, um, one way in which we can ensure that the, the traffickers are properly sentenced is through the Child Advocacy Centre, which essentially is our uh, forensically trained social workers working with the local task, in, task force for law enforcement. And when we get that... Uh, accurate witness statement we can work with the task force to package it correctly for the prosecutor to hopefully get a hefty sentence for those that perpetrated against those children um, the last pillar number four are our freedom centers um, they're essentially a central location that comprises all the holistic care a survivor will need such as psychological assessment therapy skills training cooking painting how to fill out a job application we don't believe necessarily in the uh, um, how can I call it, institutionalized care, but what, what we're focused on is actually getting people back to independence. Anyway, that gives you a bit of a broad brushstroke uh, idea of what we, what we do. But just getting on to, um, to start with online child exploitation, the video we were going to watch um, was about a little boy um, that is gaming. And in that, uh, he thinks, uh, within the game, he meets another person who he thinks is a young girl of 13 years old. What it is really is it's, a, it's an older man who's, who's predating himself against children. And so what happens to that little boy, and this is based on the true story, is that during his time playing the game, uh, the, the said person offers them cheats to get to the next level in the game, and by doing so, he asks him to do favors for him or her. And they, get, they enter this dialogue and he starts taking off some clothing and it kind of escalates and get worse, gets worse and worse. To the point where the little boy says, I don't want to do any more of that. And then the person reveals himself and says, well, if you do not do what I'm telling you to do now, I will, th I will show your family, your friends, your social media, all of these images and expose you. Now it doesn't show this on the video because it's too harsh to show it, but that little boy actually threw himself off a balcony and killed himself. And that person, the good news is the police did catch that person. When they followed the line of inquiry, that one person had been doing the same thing to 174 other children. And what's even more shocking about that is um, when the police knocked on the door of the children's parents, they had no clue that it had happened. Now, during this global crisis, we have seen an increase, a significant increase of calls to the human trafficking hotline. Reports that relate to domestic servitude, that relate to sex trafficking, that relate to labor trafficking, but also that relate to online child exploitation, such as I've just described. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, for example, said their calls went up by 90% in the US. I mean, I know that they already received thousands of calls which is uh, a, a, horrend a horrendous thing. Um, so, you know, what, what are we doing? Well, A21, <laughs> we believe we're called to stand firm in the progress. We believe we're called to stand momentum. You know, we're, we're resolute and we've decided not to back down and, and not to take our foot off the gas. But <laughs> in the face of that, we have had to absorb higher costs. You know, our team have had to be extremely creative in finding ways that we can serve the survivors in this season. Because the reality is, 
aftercare costs are hugely expensive. And sadly, today they're even more expensive. We're also resolute to keep, um, uh, keep going because if we, if we allow this isolation of the, of the survivors to continue, or if we take our foot off the gas for even a moment, the risk of being re-trafficked is very, very high. So in summary, you know, our, our, our focus right now is, um, is you know, now our financial needs to sustain A21's core programs, such as the campaigns around the world, the 24 seven human trafficking hotline, the child advocacy centers are a very important piece, having the legal support to prosecute the traffickers, and of course, keep the freedom centers open. So, so that's really a bit, of a, a bit of an overview, Lauren. I hope that's helpful. If anyone wants to see that video, they can go to a21.org forward slash can you see me. There's a whole raft of videos that show how exploitation works and what to do about it in different countries around the world. Thank you, Christian. It's so interesting to hear about all the different aspects of um, trafficking. You know, you think it's one thing and actually it's something so much bigger. Um, so what we're going to actually do is, is we're going to move on to um, Inoni Chadburn, who is the head of humanitarian support at Tear Fund. Um, so Inoni, are you available to speak to us today? Yeah, here I am. Just to Hello, just welcome. So everyone can see me. Um, can you hear me all right as well? We can indeed take it away. Oh, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you ever so much for this opportunity to be able to talk to you today. Um, my name is Inoni, Inoni Chadburn, and I'm head of humanitarian support for a tier fund. Um, that means my role comes alongside what we have as regional teams. And when there is a point of crisis, uh, we escort them, we work with them, whether that's a cyclone, whether that's a new displacement due to conflict, whether that is a, an earthquake. And we come alongside our teams and our partners and the communities that we serve on the ground. And we see what we can do to support them in this response and strengthen them in their response. So as you can imagine, uh, during the course of uh, COVID-19, Normally, our geography of where we intervene and where we act uh, is usually restricted to, uh, and we, we, we have a chronology, we have a, uh, it's synchronized, you know, we have one earthquake here followed by another situation here followed by another situation here. For us, this has been an extraordinarily busy time of unprecedented parallel support that we have had to provide. Uh, and I'll unpack this for more for you during, during the course of today. So for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tier Fund is a relief and development agency. And we really want to focus on the power of the local church. Uh, we work with over 15,000 uh, local churches uh, who have um, uh, been gone through our church and community transformation processes uh, and have facilities work alongside them. But we also move uh, via the power of social movements. Uh, we bring together survivors networks who have been subject to sexual and gender based violence. Uh, we bring together movements around self help groups. Uh, and those self-help groups are able to come together and support each other during critical times like this. We work with partners uh, as such as nationally registered NGOs, local level NGOs that we, we do traditional projects with. And where necessary, we also directly Im Im implement. And because of this level of, of diversity, we have been able to, to flux. So, so what happened for us when we responded? Well, when we responded, um, we spotted that things were going to get quite bad in, in February. And we started to anticipate and we started to scenario plan. And based on our experiences of Ebola, the work that we've done in Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia uh, and Democratic Republic of Congo, we knew the prognosis was just not good. Um, for me, what was most heartbreaking was defining how we identified the most vulnerable and how do we identify when the need is greatest when we were working in over 45 different countries globally. Um, and it's what I would call the, the spreadsheet response. Normally I'm able to engage and have those direct relationships with, with people on the ground and actually understand things more. COVID has meant I have to build myself into a new way of remote working and, and relate to my counterparts, my colleagues, partners in, in new ways. And, and data, we've had data coming out of our ears, trying to understand the information that is coming up, trying to assimilate that all together to give us the best effective uh, content to be able to make decisions. But the conclusion we came to, those who 
uh, were the most in need were those who had lack of access to health care um, in critical crisis already, uh, who were denied of their rights or socially excluded or marginalised from their society. And I, I think um, for us that meant people like uh, internally displaced people, uh, refugees, um, those who are already in the heart of a, a critical crisis. Uh, and uh, I was speaking or, or uh, in touch with uh, Ephraim, who is our country director for Ethiopia. And he said, um, the locust plague combined with COVID-19 meant that all our development efforts uh, were on the brink of collapsing and everything that we've been investing into was taken away. We heard of the story in Ethiopia, in Northern Ethiopia, uh, of uh, Adama who has seen uh, her, her staple crop, teff, that she needs to use, she trades in, she also uses in her household uh, consumption. It's increased by 40% the inflation. And it's been an artificial hoarding of food that is having knock-on impacts on small business holders like hers and the other members of her self-help groups. Or we heard of the story of Magdala village in northern Ethiopia, where the conversation was that COVID was a curse from God and that community needed to gather in the mosque to pray, just, you know, against the whole opportunity of social distancing. Um, so it's, it's those kind of things where, where COVID is what I would call a negative accelerator. It's been amplifying systemic poverty issues and compounding them further. And it's really bitter and difficult for us to manage. So what specifically was TIF on doing? Well, 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 we ended up working through into what I call a, a three-phase response. So, so phase one was we mapped out our own business continuity. Uh, one of the critical issues we needed to work out was who could move where? What partner was capable of doing what? Where, was the, where, where could we operate safely? Uh, and providing that duty of care and safety to those that we were in partnership with as well. But at the same time, and we recognized from our learning from Ebola um, that resource, resources, information needed to get out there quickly, fast and globally. So we knew from our experiences in Ebola that communities needed to trust their sources of information. Maybe they had a broken relationship with the government. Maybe they didn't want to be trusting uh, information that was coming out over the radio. A lot of the time, the critical source of their information was a trusted faith leader. And we knew then that places, uh, the, the village like Magdala, uh, we knew that we were able to then get correct and appropriate information to them in a community discussion setting. And they now know differently in Magdala. But we developed these online resources. And if you're interested for yourself, you can go to Tier Fund Learn. And we were absolutely blown away by how much they were downloaded. Within the first six weeks, we had 10,000 downloads of all of our resources, people were desperate to have trusted sources of good and effective information about how they could do water and sanitation programs, what was the theology behind uh, um, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we realized that there was just such a desperate need for that information and we could fill that gap uh, and we willingly uh, did so. The second phase we moved into was with the money we began to gather in. We went to do emergency projects, particularly on public health education and water and sanitation issues. So we gave out radio messaging uh, to, to um, hundreds of thousands of people in different parts of the world. Uh, we established uh, safe water, access to safe water so people can wash their hands. Uh, we spoke often in the UK about uh, uh, PPE and access to PPE. As a health colleague said to me, I'm not so worried about PPE, I'm worried about water and soap. Um, then we moved into our third phase, uh, the longer term to address the secondary uh, economic and social impacts. And to be frank, this is where the need is absolutely the greatest. Um, we know that there have been people badly affected by COVID but they are of a, a smaller number than those who've been affected by the economic impacts. And at times like this, there is an escalation uh, of, of violence uh, between communities with domestic violence in households, um, you know, child marriages, uh, forced labor, uh, and we need to provide projects that provide that social protection. Um, we also need to provide livelihoods uh, and more kind of like support to provide projects to establish, re-establish livelihoods. But this has been set against a backdrop of 
cuts. We, we've had to make 15% uh, budget cuts for us as an organization, recognizing that we have uh, a, a, a begin to have see donors, international donors make different decisions. Um, it's against a backdrop of international restrictions on movements. Uh, and it's against, 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 uh, based against a backdrop of lack of access to flights and increasing cost of flights. Um, but I'm fortunate to work with hugely innovative and creative counterparts and we, we have all come together as an organisation to still ensure we prioritise quality and as much as possible we prioritise the effective outworking of our projects and programmes. But maybe let me leave you with a story of Mrs Gamati uh, who is uh, in Uttar Pradesh in northern India. Um, her husband uh, had died of TB many years ago. Her daughter recently died, they suspect of TB, but the, the community thought it was witchcraft and so they have socially ostracized her. Um, she is a daily wage laborer uh, with only the smallest amount of land to cultivate. And her direct quote uh, to, to uh, our partner in, in India was, no work means no food. Uh, and we provided her with dry rations and a hygiene kit uh, to be able to, to, to manage and navigate the immediate future. Uh, but what of her longer term future? Uh, the employment market, the dynamics has changed with India. in India. She competes now with returning migrants who've left their jobs in cities and don't know if they will return. And it's working with these communities that is really our long-term commitment, working with the communities to provide continued information about safe and trusted sources of knowledge about how to protect yourself against COVID, continuing to work with these communities to strengthen the power of the local church to be able to reach out uh, and be their, their trusted source of support, uh, both physically, mentally, and emo emotionally. So um, it's really great to be able to talk to you today, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you so much for sharing that and to what depth Tear Fund um, and discovering about the knock-on effects of the virus, um, but also how you are working together to really um, help bring some relief um, across the globe. So um, now we're going to hand over to Henrietta. Um, Henrietta Blythe is the CEO of Open Doors in the in UK and Ireland. So Henrietta, um, are you available to speak to us? Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello, we can Hello. indeed. Great. Lovely to be with you all, thank you. If you will, close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you are a 30-year-old woman living in the middle belt of Nigeria. You're married to a pastor and you're pregnant with your third child. You kiss your husband goodbye to go and get a checkup at the clinic. It's going to take you a few days to get there. But while you're gone, your husband is shot dead by Fulani herdsmen. You arrive home just in time for the funeral and see your husband's body lying in the grave which has already been dug. You have a chance to hug him and to whisper a prayer before the coffin arrives and then you have to leave. How would you feel? A few weeks later, COVID strikes and the whole of Nigeria is put into lockdown. You can't go out to earn money to buy food for your two children and you start to ration your supplies. You turn to your in-laws for help, but they turn their backs on you and far from helping you, they actually confiscate much of your property. You're encouraged to hear that the government is going to provide some food, aid, some food aid. Great news, good news at last. But when you get to the distribution center, you're turned away empty handed because you're a Christian. You're alone. You're heavily pregnant with two little girls to feed, grieving, desperate. But you're still praying and you're still clinging to Jesus. And just after the birth of your third daughter, one of Open Door's partners arrives and gives you a food package. How would you feel? 
This is the story of Rose, whose husband Matthew, a pastor, was shot dead by Fulani militants on the 7th of April this year. Nigeria is number 12 on the Open Doors World Watch List of the 50 most dangerous countries to be a Christian. And when she received our packet of rations, Rose said to us, I had never imagined that I would receive such gifts, but today my faith in Christ has been strengthened. Persecution is an ongoing crisis for 260 million of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. And for many of them, COVID has made the situation infinitely worse. The persecutors have increased their attacks, knowing that they can do so with impunity. Just after Rose's husband, Matthew, was killed, we heard further reports of Fulani herdsmen murdering 34 other Christians in nearby villages. And the ability to further discriminate against Christians in the distribution of food aid and protective equipment has put yet another weapon into the hands of those who wish to eradicate Christianity. Ordinarily, Open Doors would provide trauma counselling and livelihood training for widows like Rose, and leadership training and persecution survival training for her husband, Matthew, as well as discipleship training for new converts. But during COVID, the church has literally been at danger of starving to death. Many Christians are poor. They earn a daily wage. As Anoni has said, not being able to go out means no work, means no money, means no food. They have no other assets. As a result, church leaders who rely on the weekly tithe have also been at risk of starvation. So we've been focusing on providing the food and basic supplies that the church needs to keep it alive. And the need is, is just massive, as you've heard um, from Anoni and Christian. Uh, we know in Nigeria, in the Middle Belt in Northern Nigeria, there are at least 9,000 other families who need our support. In India, where we think up to 70% of Christians are Dalits and therefore by definition poor and daily wage earners. We started with the goal of reaching 50,000 people. We have actually reached 100,000 with basic supplies and we know we need to reach 50,000 more so that the need is massive and ongoing. Our vision is to see a strong global church defying persecution, standing together and sharing Jesus, no matter the cost. As Tricia said earlier, Jesus calls us to be salt and light and not to let persecution tempt us to hide our light under a bushel or to lose our saltiness. And, you know, this has just been a season when the light of Christ has been needed more than ever. Just to finish with a story from Sri Lanka, Pastor Shiant is one of the pastors our partners work with in the eastern part of Sri Lanka. And his church has experienced a lot of persecution from their devout Hindu neighbours. Just last year, a member of the church, Kumar, was badly beaten by his cousins. And when his wife and three of the other women from the church went to help him, they were also badly beaten and pelted with garbage. Seven months later, when COVID struck, Pastor Shiant realized that this was a crisis that would affect many people in the community beyond the church. He knew that many people in the community were daily laborers and would be without money and food. So he asked us and our partners to provide rations so they could reach out to the local community as well. 
And in fact, Pastor Shient and his church have supported not just their own brothers and sisters, but also a hundred families in the local community, including those who persecuted Kumar last year. As a result of this, Pastor Sheehan said to us, I see a great renewal within the church. Even the local government representative of the village has changed in his attitude towards the Christian community. We're building better relationships with the people now. Thank you so much for your partnership with us. And thank you very much. Um, wow, what an incredible testimony of, of what Open Doors has been doing. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, Henrietta. Um, so next up, um, last but no means least, we've got Sarah Mean Makute, Senior Philanthropy Executive from World Vision. So Sarah Mean, are you available to speak to us today? I am. Wonderful, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Can you see? We can indeed. We can hear you, we can see you, and we're ready to hear about what you've got to share. Fantastic. COVID-19, as you know, has affected all of us, but not in equal measure. Limpo is 13 years old and lives in Lesotho in Southern Africa with her younger brother and sister. Five years ago, her mother died and her father went across the border to South Africa to find work taking with him the children's only provision of food, schooling, and protection. The only way the children survived was through begging or going from house to house in their neighborhood, timing their visits around meal times so they could be fed. Their life was hanging by a thread, and this was all before COVID-19 came. Now they can't leave their home, and they have no means of getting food. But thankfully, World Vision, the global Christian humanitarian organization, has been working in Limpo's community and has set up a food distribution point. Limpo can collect supplies of maize meal, oil, peanut butter, and other food items to cook a nutritious meal. And along with the food, the girls also receive hygiene kits of soap, toothbrushes, and sanitary pads. But World Vision's work is not complete. We will continue to support families like Limpos until the long-term impacts of COVID-19 are no longer felt and families are thriving. Within minutes of the World Health Organization's announcement on the 11th of March, declaring COVID-19 a pandemic, World Vision launched a global emergency response covering all our 70 field locations specifically focusing on reaching the most vulnerable children. This is the largest humanitarian response in our 70 year history. It has touched every area of our work and we've reacted by adapting all our programs and redirecting resources to ensure we are doing all we can to prevent the spread of the virus and support families and their children. We are also advocating on issues that impact the most vulnerable children, and we are also strengthening health systems. However, in many countries where we work, COVID-19 is not the only crisis they are facing. From ongoing displacement in Syria and the migrant crisis in Venezuela, to the locust outbreak and flooding in Uganda and the recent Beirut explosion. For many countries, COVID-19 is just one on top of another crisis for already fragile communities. We're also deeply concerned about the plight of children. Millions of parents and caregivers have lost their jobs and income due to COVID-19, forcing them to expose their children to the most harmful and dangerous circumstances like begging, forced labor, and child marriage. It's predicted that 30 million child marriages could take place in the next 10 years as a result of COVID-19. With experience of responding to epidemics like HIV, AIDS, and Ebola, along with a dedicated team of over 36,000 staff and countless volunteers, World Vision is well-placed to tackle this virus. 
We are distributing PPE to frontline health workers, distributing reading and learning materials to out of school children, providing life-saving food distribution, and we're also training faith leaders in vital health messaging to share with their congregants. We have an ambitious goal, and it is to reach 72 million people over 18 months, providing ongoing support both in the initial stages, but also helping families rebuild in the aftermath. We're particularly focusing on child protection and livelihoods. We want to ensure families are not viewing their daughters as a burden they cannot cope with and marrying them off early. We're also supporting families to restart their businesses again. So far, we've managed to reach 45 million people, including 19 million children. But the work is not done. The remaining 27 million are those living in the harder to reach locations, such as South Sudan, Somalia, and Bangladesh, whose lives will be severely impacted, not if, but when the virus reaches them. In times of crisis is where we see world vision at its best. Responding to large scale emergencies is what God has called us to do. But World Vision and other aid agencies cannot com combat the detrimental impacts of COVID-19 on our own. And this is why we are calling on all those who love and care for children to do much more to limit the spread of COVID-19 in low-income countries and help safeguard children from the devastating aftershocks the virus could create. We have hope that we can rebuild lives, but it's going to take every single one of us to achieve this. Thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you, Sarameen. Well, there's just so much that God is doing and it's such an incredible privilege to be able to just witness and hear from you all today. Um, it's, you know, you're all part of a, a puzzle that, you know, God is putting together behind the scenes that none of us were aware of. So thank you for sharing today. Um, so this really leads me nicely into the next part of the webinar today. Um, we have a chance to hear from the founder of A21, Christine Kane. When Christine heard about our project, um, she um, really wanted to be a part of it, but unfortunately due to other diary com commitments, she wasn't able to, but she is pre-prepared and recorded this message for us. So here we go. Hi, I'm Christine Kane and I want to thank Stewardship, Trustbridge Global and the McClellan Foundation for inviting me to speak to you. I'm inspired by the work that you're doing and I am very excited to participate in the launch of the Global Rapid Response Campaign. So today I just wanted to take a few moments to share with you what I believe is the biblical calling of Christians and the church in the face of the global crisis and the uncertainty that we're in throughout history. Christians have stepped up and led while others are stepping back and holding back. The Apostle Paul actually honors the church in Macedonia that in the face of great trials, they were known for great generosity and their joy in giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and right here in sorry chapter 8 verses 1 to 5, the Bible says that we want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. 
You know, the lack of certainty about the future caused by the global pandemic can cause us to hold on more tightly to what we have. And it makes complete sense. It's a natural reaction. And yet God's calling is supernatural. In these times, more than any others, it presses on what we believe, whether we believe that God really is our source more than the circumstances of life or the world. The world's poor have been devastated by the economic fallout of the pandemic. It also increases their vulnerability to be deceived and abused by others. Who will step in on their behalf? The world is desperate more than at any other time in recent history for fearless givers who will stand in the gap right now. They are waiting for us to show up. I believe this is only possible if we are deeply rooted in God. It's one thing to give when the future is secure and there's no threat to our resources. However, it does take more than discipline to be a fearless giver in times of uncertainty. We must have a deep connection to what is certain, God's love and commitment to us, and that God is a greater source of meaning and fulfillment than anything we own or possess. This enables us to give freely as these earthly things do not define us. I believe that the global crisis caused by the pandemic is one of the greatest evangelical opportunities of our lifetime. But people are not just watching what we say about the goodness of God during this crisis, but whether our actions truly reflect our trust in God. I believe that stepping forward to be a, a fearless giver not only serves those who are in desperate need for intervention and not only frees us from trusting in the false certainties of the world, but it's the door through which people around us will literally see and experience God. I believe, I truly believe that we will see revival through acts of generosity. What a great blessing to be part of God's plan. What an awesome invitation to step into this invitation. It all comes back to our trust and belief that God is real, that he is good, that he is the only certain source for purpose, meaning and joy. You know, when I founded 821, Nick, my husband and I had no idea what we were doing, but we felt this conviction that God was calling us to be fearless in fighting human trafficking. Now, God's done amazing miracles, rescuing and restoring countless lives, but not because of our great skill or wisdom, but simply out of our willingness to step out into uncertainty. He has done all the miracles, every single one of them. And I'm confident he will do great miracles through each and every one of you. So in conclusion, I invite each and every one of you to step into your calling as a fearless giver, as I know it is God's invitation to further freedom, joy, meaning, and impact. God bless you. So whilst I know that this has all been quite a heavy webinar, but it's a lot to take in. Um, but we really hope that you feel enlightened and inspired by all that you've heard today. Now, the question remains, how do you practically respond to step out into the calling that God has prepared for each of us? So um, we've got a few slides here at hand um, that will be put up in just a moment to just tell you a little bit about next steps um, of how um, you can get involved. So stewardship, we have set up a uh, web page. So um, it's on the screen now. Um, this is for if you are a donor based in the UK and you can find all instructions on how to give either a one-off or a monthly donation to the causes mentioned today at stewardship.org.uk forward slash global response. If you are a stewardship philanthropy or DAF client, you can contact our team of account managers to arrange your donation by emailing philanthropy at stewardship.org.uk. And then also, of course, we have not forgotten those of you that have joined us from outside of the UK. We are fortunate to be partnering with Trustbridge Global, who are able to help with all international giving. Therefore, if you are based outside of the UK and would still like to give, please visit trustbridgeglobal.com forward slash global response. All of the information on the slides will be up on the stewardship website. So don't worry if you've not been able to jot it down fast enough, that's not a problem. Now, as we progress through the series, more partners will be joining us in the global response. So we'll be adding all of these and their information to the webpage um, every time a webinar takes place, as well as recordings of each webinar, and useful content for you to use to inspire your churches and friends to join in. So, 
now it is time for us to um, have the Q&A. So just so that you're aware, we are now at 3.30. So I do understand that some of you um, need to get on to other things. That's absolutely fine. Um, we're going to get to as many questions as we can. Um, and again, as I said, this is all being recorded. So you can catch up um, on our YouTube channel after this. So let me have a look. Um, we will be having Stuart from Stewardship. He's coming back. We have um, Tricia Collins from Trustbridge Global and we have Daryl Hield from the McClellan Foundation. So let's get to these questions. There are so many coming in. So thank you so much everyone who has sent um, in your questions. So um, the first one I've got is for Stuart. Aside from linking up with local churches, in what ways are the charities we're hearing from distinctively Christian? Question mark. There are plenty of people willing to support such humanitarian causes through secular charities. I'd like to know what constitutes distinctively as Christian support and how does it and how does it link to the gospel? Very good question. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for <laughs> feeding me an easy one, Lauren. Um, <laughs> the, I, I get this question in various guises so many times. What's distinctively Christian and what difference does that make? And, and I would say um, it's the holistic nature of the response. Um, in times of, of fear and crisis and lack of meaning and people not knowing where to turn, um, we bring, these causes bring practical help, really practical, on the ground, improvement to people's lives, but they're dealing with the whole person, the whole community, the whole problem mm. in a radically different way. I can't describe the difference um, in the impact that has on people's lives. Um, and, and we've never seen such openness to the gospel because a lot of institutions are, are breaking down, but the church stands solid. It brings you into community. It deals with you as a whole person, and then it solves the presenting problem, whatever that is. So I think these, these causes all have a radically different heart to them. Mm. Great, great answer. Um, so the next question is for Tricia. So it says, if on the organisational level of Trustbridge, Open Doors, Stewardship, etc., you are decentralising and distributing the workload and roles of helping on the front line, how do you maintain one, accountability, and two, relationship with first place source donors like us? Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's another kind of loaded question. Um, we at Trustbridge, you know, our kind of mandate is to basically mobilize resources for the people on the ground doing the work. We want to make it so much easier for donors to connect to the work that kind of they're, they're spurred by the Holy Spirit or, you know, just their own calling to do. So for us, we get to know these ministries um, kind of legally. We understand what, what their structures look like. We understand the work that they're doing. We understand their charitable purposes, how they are uh, distinctly Christian, like Stuart was saying, you know, we, we understand, we get to understand them um, on a very kind of unique level um, so that donors can have confidence that the work that they say they're doing, they're actually doing. Um, so we try to build some donor confidence. And in that, the relationship between us and those charities is one of accountability, where we, we look at the things that they're doing um, so that we can say with confidence, yes, this is the work that Tier Fund does. Yes, this is what A21 is doing. Um, and we can help then distribute confidence, if you will, to donors around the world. And then, yeah, we encourage people to become involved with um, the charities or the groups that they want to support, or even segments. If you are very interested in the persecuted church, become involved with the work of many groups. Go to their websites, find out what you can for yourself about what they're doing. Sign up for their, for their um, informational pieces, whether it's you know webinars that they do or newsletters that they're doing and things like that. So we actually want to be connectors um, through the way that we distribute grants or the way that we distribute donor contributions. We really want people to be directly involved as well um, in the work that these ministries are doing because it's so important. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. It's good. Um, okay, Daryl, I've got one for you. How can we as a church be a good steward of youths in this pandemic, as most of them have lost their jobs, career and hope? As a result, many are committing suicide. 
Mm. Well, I, I think one of the, <clears throat> wow, that's, yeah, it's, it's really desperate. Where's that, um, that say where that question's coming from? What, is there a particular country? Um, it's or is coming it just from a, India. India, okay. Yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, that, that's really sad um, that it's, I think that shows the, you know, the, the depth of, of the, you know, the fear and anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. if it's taken to that. I think where, um, one of the things I think where, uh, you know, the, it just takes intentionality. Uh, if we know, uh, you know, if that's, again, kind of we're looking at, at, at trends and ideas and things like that, or where, if we see where there's a lot of pain and suffering, then, um, you know, to, you know, again, to, to change maybe what we've done before, or what, whatever the traditional way that we've been uh, as, as a church relating to or reaching out to children and youth, given the context that we're in right now, what are we going to be doing different? Mm -hmm. And uh, yesterday I was, I was uh, joining another seminar here in the U S and there actually was a, um, uh, a, a, um, a, a major global survey done on, on youth that the uh, American Bible society and the United Bible societies um, uh, just did. And they just released it. And so I would say as a, as a resource, this is, would probably a great resource. I think, I think you can go to the American Bible Society um, site and look for uh, this um, research that they, uh, that they've done on, on youth. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for that. It's, it's such hard times where we're, we're starting to see that it's, it is just so much more than just masks and, and hand sanitizers and, and washing your hands. And I think that it's been such a great opportunity to hear from you all and, and all the other partners that have joined us as well to just really bring um, a reality to, to what is happening. And it, it's not to, um, I guess, depress everyone, but it's to just open our eyes to the truth. And actually, you know, yeah. we are in such a privileged position. Um, you know, we all have roofs over our head. We've got four walls around us. Um, and yeah, so, just thank you so much for your contributions, um, everyone. Um, we are actually going to move on um, just to, to wrap up things now. So thank you so much for, for joining for the Q&A. Um, I will do my best um, to look at the questions that were sent in and try and follow that up a bit later on um, uh, in, in the next week or so. So um, yeah, if you have any further questions, do send it to my email address. It's events at stewardship.org.uk. And as I said, I'll do my best to come back to you. Now, finally, um, I'm going to hand over to Mark Sheard, who is the CEO of World Vision, and he's just going to share with us some closing thoughts and pray for us today. Are you around, Mark? Very much so, yes, indeed, Lauren. I, I'm, thank you very much, uh, indeed. Uh, what a privilege to be present and involved in this event. Um, I'm sure many of you, like me, have been moved by the sheer scale of the need of, of the uh, just getting a message there to start my video. I hope you can both see me and hear me now. Lauren, uh, just give me a wave if that's the case, yeah? Yes, we can indeed, Mark. We can Thanks. hear and see you. All I, all I was saying um, was what a privilege to be present and involved in this event. And I'm sure many of you, like me, were, were moved by the sheer scale of the need of the unprecedented impact of COVID on the lives of the world's most vulnerable people and communities. Um, I heard a story of, uh, of one. Uh, a, a young person from uh, called Tanda from Myanmar who wrote this. He said, before COVID, we could buy medicine for my mother. The conditions worsened when COVID came along. My father was out of a job. My mother's health worsened. So my father had to mortgage his rickshaw to raise money and keep the medicine flowing. But that meant no more money for rent. I felt so sad. Nothing to eat. A sick mother. I did not know what to do. I sneaked out with my sister, and without my parents' knowledge, we begged for money under the hot sun. I was shy asking for money, but we needed it. At World Vision, we have a prayer that was given to us by our founder, Bob Pierce, 70 years ago. May our hearts be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I'm sure we've all heard stories this afternoon that have begun to break our hearts. It began with that video right at the beginning of our session this afternoon. But we've also heard some tremendous good news. And the good news is that God is at work. 
In this global crisis, he's mobilized his worldwide church to respond in so many ways, to bring his gracious mercy, his compassionate love into the lives of those who have been so horrendously stricken by this crisis. God's at work in the ministries of the agencies that we've heard from today. A21, Tear Fund, Open Doors, and of course, World Vision, I have to mention. But God's also at work in those who are enabling these agencies to work by enabling generosity and particular thanks go to Tricia and Daryl, and especially to Stuart and Lauren and the team at Stewardship who've put on this event. But what's brought us all together today is much more than an event. I believe it's a mission. It's a work of God, something that goes well beyond this webinar and will spread out to all corners of the world. It is indeed an extraordinary work of God. As someone said earlier, these extraordinary times call for an extraordinary response. They call for astonishing generosity. I was deeply moved when I heard a story of generosity that came from Ghana. In Ghana at World Vision, we support uh, an, a number of communities of women uh, by enabling them with microfinance to start their own businesses making clothes. We, they've been particularly well supported by our Korean brothers and sisters in World Vision Korea. They heard that what South Korea had been badly affected by COVID, these women, so they stopped making clothes and they made face masks and sent them back to those who had been supporting them in Korea with love and thanks for the generosity they had experienced, returning generosity in great measure to them. This is an amazing work of God. This is God changing the hearts of people. My friends, we've been wonderfully informed today, but I sincerely believe, deeply believe, that we're called to be more than just informed. But God is asking us to be involved. He's asking us to prayerfully consider how we can help. What does it mean to be generous at this time? What is the call that he's putting on our hearts? I'll leave you to work that out individually with the Lord. And I'll just close in prayer. I'm just going to use a brief prayer that's based on uh, the closing words of 1 Thessalonians. It is that we might all go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, holding fast that which is good, rendering to no one evil for evil, that we might strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honour everyone, and love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you all, all of us, in all that we do, in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark, so much um, for your thoughts and your words. Um, it is such an inspirational time for us. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we hope and look forward to you joining us in next week Thursday. So on the screen we have a slide with the information of the webinars taking place over the next four weeks. So um, we will be starting with Lebanon um, and the Middle East. All details can be found at www.stewardship.org.uk forward slash global response. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay blessed and have a great day. <laughs>